Their call for freedom and dignity set off a wave of uprisings across the Arab world. But five years on, why are so many Tunisians disillusioned with what was called the Arab Spring? And what has the region learned from Tunisia? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fuli Batibo. It's not often that the actions of one man set in motion events that affect millions. But so it was for Mohamed Bouazizi, a Tunisian street vendor who set himself on fire five years ago. His actions triggered a revolution in his country that ended with the downfall of President Zin El Abidin Ben Ali and his 23 years of authoritarian rule and inspired millions of people to rise up armed with a belief that change was possible. Al Jazeera's Nazanin Musheri returned to Sidi Bouzi to meet the family and friends of a young man who, without meaning to, made history. Ali Bouazizi says his cousin Mohammed was trying to sell his fruit and vegetables, but the police kept moving him on. He didn't have a permit, but there were no jobs, and his family relied on his income, so he had to take the risk. The police decided to confiscate his cart and scales. When he went to the municipality to meet the governor, he was turned away. They refused to speak to him. Mohamed Wazizi's goals in life were simple. He wanted to earn enough money to get married and to help his family. But the constant police harassment, corruption and poverty prevented him from achieving his ambitions. Perhaps he felt humiliated after a policewoman slapped him or hopeless about the future. Whatever his reasons, Mohamed Bouazizi decided he wanted to die, right outside the offices of the officials who treated him so badly. His friend Ahmed Klili was close by. Bouazizi set himself on fire because he felt discriminated against. I was in front of the municipality building. I saw him on fire. I saw people surround him and try to put the flames out. It was such a painful scene. Mohammed felt lonely. He was suffering a lot at the time and had many problems. No one was there to listen to his concerns and worries. His friends and family took to the streets. Ali Bouazizi was the first to upload their videos on Facebook. We were able to raise slogans like employment is our right and you gang of thieves. We spoke out against the injustices and Mohammed's fate. That was the beginning. Within weeks there were protests across Tunisia. Mohammed's plight resonated with so many people because they were also suffering from some of the same frustrations. After staying in hospital, Mohammed died on the 4th of January 2011. Ten days later, President Zine El Abedin Ben Ali fled the country. I remember how things were straight after the revolution. People stood together. Unfortunately, politicians make promises and fail to keep them. We're asking for more national unity. We hope our region gets its share of development and the state reaches out to people here. People here are tired of the slow pace of change since the revolution. Many here say that life is more difficult now. But the death of Mohamed Bouazizi did give Tunisians the freedom and dignity that eluded this young man all of his life. Nazani Mashiri, Al Jazeera, Sidi Bouzid, Tunisia. Well, let's bring in our guests now for today's Inside Story. From Tunis, Rafiq Abdel Salam, Tunisian politician and head of external affairs for the Enhada Party. In Florence, Italy, Nadia Marzucchi, author and political scientist at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. And in New York, Nicholas Snow, Middle East analyst and co-director of the Tunis Exchange. Thank you all for being on Inside Story today. Rafiq Abdel Salam in Tunis, if I may begin with you. Tunisia, of course, is hailed as a success for the Arab world, but the aftermath of the revolution hasn't been easy and as we just saw in Nazanin Musheri's report many people in Sidi Bouzid still feel largely ignored today what do you say to Tunisians especially the young Tunisians who still feel marginalized and who say it was all for nothing I think with all difficulties that we faced in the past and uh, still facing today the Tunisian track still uh, move on 
Uh, of course, the situation is not ideal, but there is no doubt that uh, the space of freedom that Tunisians are, you know, living today uh, was unexpected or is unexpected uh, um, compared to the previous uh, era of, uh, under the regime of uh, Ben Ali. So politically speaking, there is an ex good progress, let's say here. We succeed to draft a progressive constitution. We organized uh, two uh, elections, le le legislative and then presidential elections, free and democratic uh, elections. Um, the space of freedom is wider than, than it was in the past. But uh, definitely there is a huge gap between the aspirations of the people and the concrete uh, daily life of the people, mainly amongst the young uh, genera generations mm. and more particularly within the inner cities in the, in the country. So there is a lot of job that needs to be done to improve the quality of the life of the people and to uh, implement the expectations of the young generation who raise up against the regime of Ben Ali. Nadia Marzouki in Florence. Mohamed Wazizi was frustrated by the poverty and the marginalization that he experienced by the corruption and abuse of power by government officials at the time. Has the revolution's cry for dignity and freedom, in your opinion, been answered? Have things changed on that aspect? Well, I agree with uh, Rafiq, and I would say that uh, indeed, despite all the difficulties, Tunisia has achieved something incredible institutionally and politically. Uh, that being said, uh, the, the events that took place last week in Tunisia illustrate the extent to which aspirations of the youth has not, have not been been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, a young student uh, called uh, Afra Ben Aza has been arrested in Le Kef for apparently no reason other than the fact that she was demonstrating to defend, uh, to protest against the transformation of a, of a coffee shop. Um, last week, three artists have been jailed for no other reason than smoking uh, in their apartment. Uh, last week, 10 students have been arrested and sentenced to one year prison and condemned to a uh, 500 euro fine just uh, because they were uh, suspected and blamed for uh, mm. homosexuality. Uh, so my point is that the gesture of Boazizi was a claim for social justice, economic justice and dignity. And the protest of these uh, young people today in Tunisia illustrate the need for a cultural revolution for a youth revolution that is still uh, that is still not taken into account by uh, political officials. So, in your view, so social justice hasn't have been a long achieved way yet. To go. Okay, let me bring in Nicholas No uh, in New York. Nicholas, you've covered Tunisia extensively, of course, since uh, the, the so-called revolution, and you've been there uh, very often. What is your view of the current situation uh, in the country for ordinary Tunisians, especially those who are living uh, in the affluent cities? Are the conditions different? Are they better now? Well, in the affluent cities and I think in the interior regions and some of the southern regions, people are hurting. People are widely hurting um, at all different class levels. Um, certainly the working class folks are, are, are undoubtedly hurting uh, far worse than some of the people at the elite level. That's true. Um, I think, you know, five years on, uh, Tunisia, as I, I think, the other analysts and the Rafiq will uh, agree, um, Tunisia is hurting. Tunisia is an incredibly dangerous moment right now um, where uh, a lot of very bad things could happen to the country mm. and there's a lot of fear and concern. I'd say that that's actually perhaps the, the dominant uh, aspect, as it is indeed here in America as well. Fear is really pervasive across so many different categories of society and for all Tunisians that's quite understandable. Look at Libya right on the border, falling apart or fallen apart, although we have perhaps positive movements towards some kind of a peace deal today or in mm. recent weeks. The southern areas of the Sahara, you know, ungoverned spaces, southern Algeria and Algeria itself, sure. the whole Mediterranean region is essentially on fire. Right, but Nicholas, you say Tunisia is hurting, but you have to admit though that politically there has been progress. I mean, looking to the east, one possible outcome for Tunisia was to fall into a cycle of military coups, like has uh, been the case in Egypt, for instance. Exa but this, is, this didn't happen in Tunisia. I mean, the military stayed in their barracks. How do you explain this? How do you explain the political success that the country has experienced in the last five years? 
I think that all of us will and continue to laud Tunisia for its democratic transition. Of course, it was recently the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, or at least four NGOs that aided that process. Rafi is a part of a process and affiliated with the party that played a major role in doing that. Um, and I think that everyone congratulates Tunisia and the Tunisians and their political parties and representatives for that. Mm. The core problem is that so much of that work of the last three or four years could be swept away quite quickly, quite quickly, unfortunately. Tunisia is in an incredibly weak, precarious state. It does not have a particularly strong army. That's a part of a history, of a particular history of Tunisia, mm. a particular history, uh, particular history of the kind of dictatorship that existed in, in Tunisia, a kind of Western-backed dictatorship that focused on keeping the army very weak and the police and security services much stronger. So Tunisia should be lauded, but all of that, in the matter of really a few events, we've already seen three terrorist attacks in the last year, and in fact, many more broken up and some smaller ones uh, throughout the last year, oh, you know, more of those kinds of attacks really have an incredible ability to really break open the country. Right. It's much more fragile than other countries, unfortunately. Let's, let's hear from Rafiq. Uh, Rafiq Nicholas has a very bleak uh, view uh, for the future of Tunisia. I mean, he, he sounds very negative, Nicholas, I must say. Rafiq, do you agree with this? Is Tunisia today a weak and, and fragile state, even though it continues to be applauded and praised today as one of the success stories of uh, the, the so-called Arab Spring. I fully agree with uh, Nicholas for the simple reason that Tunisia is not immune from the risk of the, of the environment, regional environment. One of the lessons that we have uh, drawn from the Tunisian revolution itself mm. is the interconnectedness of the uh, regional environment. When the Tunisian revolution started in Tunisia, it had echoes in different, you know, Arabic capital. Indeed. In uh, Tripoli, in uh, da, in uh, in Cairo, in Damascus, in Sana'a, everywhere. And now, when you have, you know, political crises and civil wars in different, you know, parts of the Middle East, and more particularly in the Arab world, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, everywhere, and the neighboring country, when you have a, a deep crisis in Libya which is uh, associated with the dismantlement of the state apparatus and the circulation of arms. So we are affected by the regional environment and more particularly from Libya. But uh, I'm, I'm fully convinced that uh, uh, democracy is a, a complicated and painful journey. And with all difficulties that we faced in the past and still facing today, mm. we succeed in managing the situation in a rational way. And this is what creates what could be, you know, called Tunisian exceptionalism well, talk, in the region. Well, talk to us about your experience with your party, Inada uh, Rafiq. You, you spoke about the lessons learned. And in the same way that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, did in Egypt, Inada gained uh, a majority of votes in the first democratic elections in uh, Tunisia. But Inada chose to take a different course from the Muslim Brotherhood not monopolizing power. Why is that? What lessons? Did you learn a lesson from what happened in Egypt uh, in order to, to progress in, in politics, your party in particular? Definitely, you know, we learned the lessons from the Tunisian revolution as well from the coup d'etat that what happened, in, uh, what happened exactly in, in Egypt for the simple reason that the region is, uh, as I said before, is deeply interconnected. Uh, one of the lessons that we have drawn is the need for political players to work together to manage politics based on the norm of the art of consensus. Mm -hmm. And I think another party was in the vanguard of this uh, process. We made a lot of concession and we managed politics based on the norm of consensus, consensus between different you know, political players. And since the beginning of the revolution, we, uh, we, we, we choose to, to be, uh, to, to, uh, to the idea of power sharing, to share powers with other political uh, forces within a coalition government. And then when we are becoming, you know, the second party after the election of 2014, we, uh, we, ch we choose to be included in the government and to share power with other political forces for the simple reason that we are fully convinced that uh, the situation in Tunisia, in a post-revolution situation, in a transitory period, different political forces, mainly moderate, you know, democratic uh, Islamic parties with moderate securities need to work together. Mm. But Nadia, in Florence, uh, Rafik talks about, of course, the successes politically, but when you look at the political leadership in Tunisia today, many of the faces that we're seeing today are faces of the old regime, including the current president, uh, Beji Kaid Esepsi. I mean, how different politically is Tunisia really today from what it's been in the past? Are, are things really different? Have things changed? Are the ideas different? Are the plans different? 
Yeah, exactly. This is one of the main challenges and ironies of the so-called political miracle in Tunisia. I would say that the very factor that contributed to Tunisia's success, namely its unique capacity to reach compromise, is also the causes the cause of of the numerous challenges today because this obsession with national unity with compromise with consensus comes with the cost which is the exclusion of society mm -hmm. the marginalization and criminalization of social protest and the exclusion of the very important question of cultural revolution we we see now that the youth is aspiring to a different lifestyle and that this lifestyle is constantly criminalized let me also underline to go back to your comment about the figures figures of the former regime that this more public moralization of the youth practice is happening under a government that has a majority uh, led by nida tunis that based all its campaign on anti-Islamism and that uh, such, uh, such a criminalization of uh, supposedly unacceptable moral practices did not happen under the Troika government led by Nahda. So that says a lot again about how wrong we were when we were completely uh, fantasizing about the risk of an Islamization of society. Oh. Now to go back to your question about the, uh, the return of the former regime, yes, it is a major problem. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a major risk, but I would say that uh, there's no reason to be pessimistic because despite all the difficulties, the civil society remains extremely mobilized despite sure. all the pressure from the police state. And there is a very good chance that in the near future, this former regime hegemony will be seriously challenged. Uh, you, of course, spoke of the strength of the civil society in Tunisia, and I think we, we all agree that this has been one of the the key things that have has made the success possible in this country. Uh, Nicholas, I want to come back to one of the points you were making earlier, and that is the threat, the insecurity in the country, the threat of uh, radical, uh, radical elements. I mean, when you look at uh, the number of foreign fighters in uh, places like Syria today or Iraq, a lot of Tunisians are among the ranks of these foreign fighters fighting alongside uh, ISIL. How do you explain this, uh, that so many young Tunisians today are joining the ranks of ISIL? Well, this is something that people spend a lot of effort on. I think there's some key sort of headline reasons that we can cite. Um, a lot of it is because of uh, some of the significant social, economic, and political problems that exist in Tunisia. Um, that's, that's certainly true. The main issue, however, is twofold. One is that there are a series of wars going on in the region that are sucking the positive political, social, and economic energy out of the region. Mm -hmm. If you want to deal with Tunisia's instability and growing instability, you have to stop the war in Libya and you have to stop the war in Syria. That's the main thing. The second thing to do is not so much to focus on the extremist Tunisians who are fighting abroad or even the dangers lurking all around Tunisia. These are significant issues, it's true, but the main problem is within Tunisia, within the body politic of Tunisia, and primarily it rests in the security services. Actually, I would argue this, the, the primary problem facing Tunisia beyond the wars in the region, which is the headline issue, mm -hmm. is actually a very corrupt and inefficient parallel state in the country. And that's made up of the security services, a bunch of business elites that are highly monopolistic and parasitic, and some traditional mafias. And this triangle of power has been resurgent, especially in the last year. It's been coming back, in fact, ever since Mohamed Bouazizi lit himself on fire and, and the dictator Ben Ali left. And it's fully reasserting itself in mm. very dangerous ways that affect the small shop owner on the corner up to the member of parliament, through to civil society, and some of the other activists, artists, well, and citizens of Tunisia. And let's, and let's allow Rafik to respond to this, the uh, main Nicholas. Uh, let's allow Rafik to respond to this, because Rafik, of course, is a Tunisian politician, uh, uh, you know, member of Ena uh, the Enada party. Uh, Rafik, what do you respond to, to what Nicholas has just said, and the idea of this corrupt parallel state that is basically responsible for uh, you know what we're seeing today the the high insecurity in Tunisia and so many young Tunisians uh, joining the ranks of ISIL I think um, 
some young people joining, you know, terrorist and radical groups in, in the region for the simple reason that uh, we have to understand the complexity of the transitory period or mm. the, the process of transformation in this country. Um, uh, bearing in mind that uh, a revolution means by definition to shatter the old foundation of the old regime and to set up, you know, to the build the foundation of new political order. Mm -hmm. And in this process of transformation, definitely, you know, these difficulties are uh, uh, expected. So these uh, terrorist groups benefited from the weakness of the state after the revolution, right. which is very normal in process of political transformation. Right. The other element is uh, uh, related to the political crisis and civil wars in the region, mainly in Libya, when you have a neighboring country which is in a state of uh, full mess, and when you have circulation of arms, but it's not just and you down have arms to, to that external, circulated as in you the say, hands it's of not just down to external factors, uh, Rafiq. I mean, you mentioned the weakness of the state after the revolution when uh, your party, Enada, was ruling uh, in the Troika. Insecurity grew in Tunisia, and you know, Tunisians again have, has now Tunisian has become one of the most common nationalities of foreign militants fighting with ISIL. People basically today blame Enada for not doing enough at the time, for not stopping. Uh, radical preaching in mosques at the time for the, the current insecurity. What do you respond? Well, you have to to uh, to, to bear in mind that we classified Ansar Sharia. It's another, another party, or more particularly the government uh, of Troika, which was led by another, which is uh, classified Ansar Sharia as a terrorist group. Mm. We do our best, you know, to fight or to face, you know, radical uh, elements. But you have to bear in mind we are a democratic party in a process of transformation. Our strategy were, was based on a process of uh, or mechanisms of uh, providing mechanisms of adaptation for peaceful element even, even if they are you know uh, extremist and to fight you know the radical and violent elements so this is the price of democracy but i think we when we discovered that the terrorist groups are in process to 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 use arms and uh, to threaten the stability the very stability of the state we face them we face them in the typhest way mm. so it's not uh, uh, it's not reasonable to say that another was you know um, uh, w w w was w w was not fighting, okay. you know, terrorist groups or radical elements. Let's hear from Nadia now in Florence. Nadia Nicholas has painted a, a bleak picture for for the future of Tunisia, uh, saying that this is a fragile state which risks descending into chaos today. What is your view? How hopeful and optimistic are you today about the future of Tunisia? Well, uh, I agree with, uh, with what Nicolas and uh, Rafik said. Uh, I would also just uh, add that um, repression and exclusion cannot be the only method uh, against uh, radicalization. So uh, the outcome of the policy of the Troika should not be dismissed uh, so quickly because they did try to uh, opt for the strategy of repression and inclusion. And I think that uh, today we will have to keep this uh, two-tier approach and understand that uh, as much as we need to fight uh, vehemently against jihadism and violent radicalization. We also need to uh, start a reflection on the concept of radicality and ask ourselves whether radical politics and the young people who opt for this option, this political option that is an illiberal option, but can we include them in the democratic game? Because mm. democracy should be about the broader pluralistic inclusion of the the okay. the most the biggest uh, uh, number of options and i think one of the challenges for tunisia today is to uh, learn how to conjugate this obsession with compromise with an endorsement and a concretization of pluralism nadia thank you so much for an interesting discussion thank you all uh, rafiq abdel salam nadia marzuki and nicholas no thank you and thank you as well for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on the program's page of our website, aljazeera.com, or you can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Bad Tibo, and the whole team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.